Good afternoon, we are here in SOAS, uh, University of London, uh, with one of the uh, greatest scholars in innovation, technological change, patents, uh, Professor Browning Hall. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here today with us. Um, we are having this conversation uh, while we are going to have also an important event here in SOAS, organized by the Department of Economics and uh, School uh, Finance and Management which is the Penrose Lecture, a new series that we've been organizing here and uh, Professor Brandon Hall has been uh, uh, the, the first person that started with this, with this series. Uh, the reason why we invited Professor Brandon Hall is really because she's been one of the great scholars in this area of research, which is very much close to Edith Penrose's work and, and, and so on. May I ask you, how did you start getting okay. Okay. involved I, in this research? It's <laughs> not unconnected to interests that interested Edith Penrose, but from a completely different side. Uh, the, my history is that I was an undergraduate physics major, and then I became a computer programmer in physics for four years, high energy physics, and, and then I switched to programming in economics, because that's where the jobs were, uh, and, and because I moved locations and it was easier, physics was very uh, specialized and it wasn't always possible to get a job in that area. Uh, and I gradually became more and more interested in the methods and using data in economics and so forth because I was, that's what I was doing with my computer programming. And I was really learning statistics at the same time. And, uh, and I came at it, there was a big concern that our productivity had slowed down in the United States and the person I was working for, Svi Grilicus, um, who was a professor at Harvard University, uh, became interested in using um, studying the role of research and development in productivity change and whether that was going to help to account for some of the productivity slowdown. I think in the end we more or less concluded that that might not be the case, but I was very interested in working with the patent data and working with the R&D data and, um, and so that's where I started and then as time has gone by that topic, you could say I was lucky because I started on a topic which turned out to become much more important in the next, you know, two or three decades. Uh, the R&D and patents literature morphed into the innovation literature and, uh, and I became highly cited because, <laughs> because I was one of the early people in the area. So then I went to graduate school and got a PhD. So you see, not everybody uh, does things in the right order. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess that's, you know, that's how I got into the innovation field. Right, right. Yeah. I, as you said, I mean, this is one of those topics which have become, you know, dominant in uh, in the economics, but also in the development literature and in the policy, the practice of policy. You mentioned the productivity puzzle as one of the yeah. topics that, in a sense, uh, has been coming up since the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. since the time you were yes, engaging in this topic, is now back. Yeah. What is your understanding of and your opinion around how the productivity puzzle in this specific historical moment is unfolding? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I find that actually an interesting area of research. And recent research, both in the UK, in Europe, and in the United States, has exposed the fact that part of the productivity slowdown puzzle is that there's wider divergence within industry across firms. The most successful firms, in fact, their productivity is growing. Um, but there are many, many, many other firms whose productivity is lagging. And this is related to issues, uh, probably related to income inequality. If this is the case, what do we do about it? From an innovation economist perspective, we would like to ensure that entry is not too expensive for people with good ideas. And regulated sectors, um, as we know from our experience, for example, in the telephone sector, um, the breakup of AT&T was driven by technological revolutions. Um, in telephone service, and we would not have, if we had insisted on maintaining telecoms monopolies, we would not have all the benefits we have today from the multiple, um, mo from the mobile telephone Absolutely. sector. It's yeah. very interesting you mentioned uh, lots of economics you're interested in is starting from policy issues, right? Yeah. Real issues, mainly you think about uh, the, the late policy of Slabini, who used to say, right, economics has to be about rigor but also relevance, yeah. right? And this is one of the probably issues that you know, characterize our work here in SOAS in the economics department where we, we try to uh, engage uh, and make our students mm -hmm. engage with lots of the policy issues. In your lecture also now you were mentioning about the importance of the institutional environment, right? Mm -hmm. and the, the policy dimensions that 
uh, enter into it in terms of shaping, designing the way in which the market develop, and more particularly how the innovation process develop, develop into it. Right. What do you make of the current discussion? There has been a resurgence of interest for industrial innovation policy, technology policy. Uh, in these days, we know in the US, uh, the Trump administration has been discussing about rebringing, you know, some industries uh, into into a quite deindustrialized yeah. type of country, and of course, this is another big topic uh, yeah. here in the UK. Yeah, that's true. It is a big topic here, and it's after all, it's a topic in Western Europe too. I don't rule out industrial forms of industrial policy or technology policy, especially in smaller countries that ha have a need to specialize to some extent because they can't do everything on the frontier. Um, but, but I'm not in favor of the form we're taking now, which is that we'll just, you know, keep everybody out. Therefore, then we can, we can preserve industry. For one thing, it's not going to happen. The workers in the steel industry have been quoted as saying this is 40 years too late. Absolutely. Um, because you can't, these the mothball factories can't be right. brought back. Um, and one of the interesting evolutions has been that, first of all, the manufacturing sector share has stabilized in the United States. But there is a question, uh, which you're not going to stop, but it is true that the labor share has fallen. Uh, the labor, the, the number of employees in that sector have fallen, <laughs> right? Manufacturing sector itself is, is very efficient. The history of the, of the US is a, is a very interesting story of a country which has been, for many years, building up its capacity using industrial policy, and to a certain extent, when entered in a phase of deindustrialization, as you mentioned, right, try to see how to recover, you know, in some of these areas. And well, our, our, you know, our, the thing about our industrial policy um, <laughs> is is that it wasn't really conscious. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a question of it was there because the Defense Department funded a lot of research between 1941 and now, um, and that has, you know, produced spun off a lot of technology. But the reason they funded the research wasn't because we had a technology policy or an industrial policy, other than the famous uh, writings of Vannevar Bush back yeah. in, uh, at the end of the war. Um, the, um, it was primarily because the Defense Department had needs for certain you know, items. So I, I distinguish between that and, mm -hmm. and the policy that says, we are going to have a steel industry. We will now take government money and pour it into the steel industry. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's, there are different things. Absolutely. It, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't argue. I mean, it is an unfortunate fact of the history of technological technological innovation that a great deal of it is associated with war. Right. Uh, that is a very unfortunate fact. Well, in a sense, <laughs> this is one of the old inside that Chris Freeman used yeah, to. Chris Freeman, yeah, yeah, used yeah, to point yeah. out. Right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The famous, the famous horse stirrup. <laughs> Major exactly. renovation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm raising this issue because, in a sense, uh, uh, I think you know we are talking from, from, from the UK, from London. There is a big discussion about Brexit, and there is big, big, big discussion around what, are, what is the situation in this country, and how the industrialization has really threatened the fabric, partially, mm -hmm. of the society, and how that has led to a certain type of reaction, right? Yeah. And, to a certain extent, and similarly, we see some of these dynamics happening, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. which makes me think that, in a sense, we are talking about probably one of the most fundamental topics in economic, right? I mean, which is not just if you are innovating or not, but if the society, the political economy of a certain country is able to sustain the, the pressure of change over time, right? The, yeah, the, the, the way I think about it is that we do have a problem going forward, which is indicated by current, our current problem, which is the real problem is the technical change changes the skills you need, and lives are getting longer, and those two things are mismatched. Yeah. Okay, working lives are longer, and we need them to be longer because we can't afford in the developed countries with yeah. you know population, you know aging, yeah. the aging of the we we can't have people with thirty years, um, you know, on social security or whatever we call it here. I can't yeah. remember the yeah. word. Yeah. Um, uh, after their working life, it just doesn't you know it doesn't add up. And so we need people to work longer. At the same time, we have this technical change going on, which is causing people to, um, uh, causing you know, causing causing people to have skills that are no longer in demand. And that's really what happened in the U.S. So far, we've been talking about more uh, developed countries, but I know you you had some experience and you've been interested on development and development policy and so on. Uh, can you tell us something about your 
how, how, how innovation look like from yeah. that perspective and how challenging it is to uh, understand innovation that the technical change. That. My view, first of all, it's a natural interest. If you look at the world economy over the last, um, <laughs> over my lifetime, say, you know, last, over my working lifetime, the last 50 years, yeah. um, the share um, of world GDP that's going to countries other than Western Europe and the United States and Japan uh, is uh, growing, <laughs> right? So it's natural. You're more interested. Yeah. Population's growing too. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's natural to be interested. It's not even fair to call it developing at some at some level. Some of these countries are, you know, developed to where the U.S. was, you know, less than 100 years ago. <laughs> yeah, China, in a sense, <laughs> is now becoming what U.S. was yeah, becoming at yeah. the beginning of last yeah, century, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the parts of China muscles. are still not, you know. Well, beginning of last century, yes, they're definitely. I mean, Mississippi would look like parts of China. Yeah, um, that's no, that's probably true. Um, uh, but I was thinking, you know, even I mean, the country I've been studying somewhat, Chile, has had a very rapid GDP growth um, in the last uh, 30, 20, 30 years. Um, GDP per capita growth. Yeah, uh, and um, and you know, and there are other there are other examples uh, of that. Colombia, even uh, now, now that they've you know settled there set of their problems. Um, and Mexico certainly. Um, but again they have you know they have difficulties in some regions, but you know, when you go to Mexico City, um, things look pretty developed. One last question yeah. before we yeah, yeah. we close. What do you find uh, being still something that economists find very difficult to understand about innovation? What is the puzzle about, you know, what what the nature of innovation is about from your long view of your long-term <laughs> perspective on that. Uh, there, of course, well, one of them is the question I raised in the last <laughs> seminar, which is, do patents encourage innovation? Uh, but, uh, but I don't think we're going to find an answer to that. No. Um, I mean, I really do think it depends, you know, it's where and when and so forth, so it's always going to be a, a economist, you know, I have two hands, I mean, it's on the one hand and on the other hand. Um, the, um, back up from innovation and talk about invention, that's the one that, that Economists might think that they can try to understand it, but I think it's very hard to understand that. It's really a, it's for the study of, of creativity, um, and you know, for fields that are psychology, perhaps, mm -hmm. or fields that are slightly, um, slightly outside um, economics. Um, we probably ought to finish. But <laughs> thanks so much for your time, uh, and we hope to have you again here in SOS okay. soon. Thanks Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the visit.